today for our, our guest presentations. And I think, uh, as you know, we weren't able to have our face-to-face -face this year. So this is our attempt to, to bring a little bit of that, um, uh, that spirit to this group and to bring in some guest presentations who have been, um, who I think will be familiar to, to all of you because I think all three of you presented our face-to-face -face last summer. Um, so it's great to have you back and have some updates and hear about the progress on, on your work that you've made. And um, so I just want to also note, we, we did extend the invitation to some other folks at CWS who don't necessarily always participate in the Partners in Flight clients call. So I'd like to welcome those of you from the, the Lambert Technical Committee at CWS and thanks for joining. And uh, maybe this will pique your interest in fifth science and um, we'd be happy to, to reach out one-on-one -on -one and have discussions with you about what we're all about um, in the future, if that's something you might be uh, interested in partaking in. And so I just want to say, I think, Allison, I don't see you, but I heard your voice. Oh, there I see you now. Um, Allison is going to be our note taker today, so she may interject on occasion just if she needs clarity anywhere. Um, and feel free to do that, uh, Allison. And I think with that, unless anybody had any burning issues they needed to bring up, we can get started. So our first um, two speakers are Diana Strahlberg and Peter Salimus. Um, Diana just started a new position, I think on Monday, is that right? Um, as a research scientist with the Canadian Forest Service. And so luckily, um, we, yes, so that's great news for all of us, um, especially we can have continued work uh, with Diana moving into the future, but she's also going to be maintaining some of her um, roles, responsibilities at, with the Boreal Avian Modeling Project as well. Um, so that's great. And uh, Peter Slimus is also from the Boreal Avian Modeling Project. So they'll be um, co-presenting today. And then we will hear from Barry Robinson from um, Canadian Wildlife Service. And so Diana and Peter, I may just turn over to you. They'll be speaking to us today about new spatial abundance models um, to inform distribution, population, and trends for forest birds in Canada. Thanks, Elaine. I, I should say that there'll maybe be a little bit of overlap between uh, this presentation and what you heard last year, um, but uh, it's a lot more. We're presenting now a more final product. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Peter because we've actually done it in such a way that we have recorded ourselves, our presentation, so that we can share those later with a broader group. Um, so we're going to actually play a pre-recorded presentation and see how that goes. Hi, my name is Deanna Strahlberg and I'm with the Boreal Avian Modeling Project, or BAM. My colleague Peter Salamos and I will be talking to you about our work to develop new spatial abundance models that inform distribution, population, and trends for forest birds in Canada. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm located in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, which is located on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. Peter and I will talk to you today about a new set of models that builds on our previous work. Our models are always a work in progress, so we've set up a data portal on GitHub that should facilitate feedback and accommodate frequent updates. You'll hear more about the site from Peter later in the presentation. As we produce new versions, we will update the site accordingly. Older versions will be archived and metadata can be found on Zenodo at the link shown here. The Boreal Avian Modeling Project is focused on research, but one of the core goals is to inform population assessment. With our new models, we aim to develop an integrated approach that could be used to achieve a range of objectives at once. Specifically, our models are intended to result in population estimates, but also habitat-specific density estimates, as well as Canada-wide distribution maps that capture both broad-scale climate gradients as well as local habitat differences. And finally, the intention is to use our abundance models to improve regional trend estimates. Speaking of trends, everyone has probably heard about the paper in Science last year, led by Ken Rosenberg and other Partners in Flight members. There's nothing new about bird declines, but what was new about this paper was that the authors combined abundance and trend estimates to put a number on bird loss, which is all of a sudden very powerful. The paper estimated that 3 billion birds have been lost over the last 50 years, with the boreal region shown here in dark green, contributing about half a billion birds to the overall loss. So that's a really big responsibility. But we also have a lot more uncertainty in the north, as you can see by the error bars here. These error bars are focused on the trend, but we also have a lot of uncertainty about the underlying population numbers. 
The science paper used the best available population estimates from Partners in Flight, but for land birds, the numbers were based on BBS data, which are very sparse in the north due to the limited road network. At the same time, the vast boreal forest region is recognized as providing extremely important habitat for birds, with over 300 regularly breeding bird species, the large majority of which are migratory. So due to this lack of coordinated monitoring, data gaps are first on our list of data challenges. I've highlighted five central challenges here, which I will address one by one. This lack of coordinated monitoring is what prompted the creation of the Boreal Avian Modeling Project, or BAM, in 2004. The project was initiated to address the significant gaps in knowledge required to effectively manage and conserve boreal birds. The first step in this was to assemble a data set representing a compilation of point count survey data. The data set, which spans the boreal and hemiboreal regions of North America, or most of Canada, is a compilation of publicly available data, such as breeding bird atlases and BBS, as well as individual data sets that were generously contributed by numerous independent researchers and partners. By assembling enough individual point count data sets, shown in dark red on this map, we've been able to cover most of the environmental space in Canada south of the Arctic, where we've not collected survey data. This map shows percentiles of predicted survey effort based on over 100 environmental covariates and a single booster regression tree model that was based on a random sample of pixels drawn from this study area. So you can see that environmental conditions of northern regions are not very well sampled relative to southern Canada. But according to a different metric based on environmental similarity, there are just a few areas that really lie outside of the environmental space that we've sampled, which, are shown, which is shown in dark blue on this map. This environmental similarity surface, which emphasizes the magnitude of difference rather than sampling effort, shows us that the environmental conditions found in the far north and in west coast mountains are most different from what we have sampled in our data set. We're currently working on filling in these gaps in the west since the data do exist. Some of our earlier efforts took advantage of this environmental coverage to develop species distribution models based on climate and land cover using a method called Maxent. But these were habitat suitability models and did not incorporate abundance information. By modeling abundance, we can compare habitat value more accurately, but there are still many challenges involved. Because we're working with an ad hoc data set, our data are collected with a variety of different protocols under a range of conditions. And so this standardization problem is one that BAM has spent much of its early years working on. Most of this work was led by Peter Salamos, and there are now several papers you can refer to for more information about how we've standardized our data set. Although refinements are ongoing, the basic approach is summarized in a paper published in Methods in Ecology and Evolution in 2013. What we've done is to develop a method to convert count data from disparate sources into density using detectability-based correction factors. Our approach separates and models the two primary aspects of detectability. First is P of T, the probability of an individual bird singing within a given time interval. Obviously, the longer you count, the more birds you detect, and we used a removal model to estimate the singing rate parameter phi and the shape of this curve, curve shown here. The second, the second one is Q of R, the probability of detecting a singing bird within a given distance or radius. Of course, the farther away from the observer a bird is, the lower the probability that it will be heard and counted. We use distance sampling to estimate the shape of this curve based on the effective detection radius, or the, di the distance for which the probability of missing a species within that distance is equal to the probability of detecting a species that is outside the distance. For a given survey, the resulting values P and Q can then be combined with sampling area A to generate a correction factor that when multiplied by density yields the estimated count. Or in other words, the density can be estimated as a function of survey count N and these correction factors. The logarithm of the correction factors can be used as an offset in count regression models used to estimate density, as we have done. So with the standardization problem addressed, the next challenge we had to overcome was the fact that birds exhibit complex responses to environmental factors, especially over the large ranges occupied by most uh, northern forest species. We found that complex gener generalized linear models based on hierarchical variable selection approaches can work well for single species or smaller regions, um, as demonstrated by this application for the Canada warbler in Alberta. 
but models can be time consuming to parameterize properly for multiple species. And so what we've concluded is that machine learning is required to automate spatial predictions for multiple species over large areas. Specifically, we're using boosted regression trees, which is a type of ensemble modeling based on developing a sequence of regression trees, each of which is focused on capturing the unexplained, variant, unexplained variation from the previous tree. Shown here is an earlier example from my PhD work, which was focused on climate change projection. Now we're looking at a much larger suite of predictors to capture more environmental complexity. By incorporating this environmental complexity in our models, we can minimize the influence of sample bias on density estimates. In effect, we're doing an informed interpolation of our data across the study area. Another challenge is that landscape change can be pretty rapid and extensive, and especially in the boreal region. The boreal forest is particularly dynamic with very active natural disturbance regimes, as well as extensive industrial development, including forestry, oil and gas, and mining. These, map, these maps here show the extent of forest disturbance over a 25 year period and the resulting change in mapped land cover types. So we wanted to capture this rather than assuming static uh, vegetation types. And finally, we recognize that there is regional variation in species habitat relationships. Boreal birds generally have large ranges, although the boreal region is quite diverse climatically and physiographically, so naturally there are differences in habitat associations. These figures from a paper by Andy Crosby show differences in the densities of six boreal species across boreal regions on the left, and the relatively low level of niche overlap between Quebec and Alberta for the Canada warbler on the right. It's not clear if these differences are related to differences in habitat preference or differences in habitat availability, but they can be different enough that it's inappropriate to assume constant habitat relationships across the country. Model interactions can address this, but it's difficult to capture everything, so we opted for a regional approach to modeling. To address these various challenges that I've outlined, we've developed a generalized national model approach focused on these key components. First, we use machine learning to deal with complex variable interactions and nonlinear habitat responses in an automated fashion. We include many continuous covariates to capture more nuanced habitat associations and improve the temporal correspondence between avian and environmental data. And we use regional submodels to accommodate differential habitat selection, reduce out of range predictions, and achieve better sampling balance. The key elements of our methods are listed here. Additional methods and codes are available on GitHub at the link below. We built separate models for each bird conservation region, or BCR, subregion, which consisted primarily of the inter intersections between BCRs and provinces, with some aggregation of smaller units. Each of these units was buffered by 100 kilometers so that we had regions of overlap among multiple models along the edges. We used primarily human point count survey data with a few ARU data sets included. The ARU data were treated in the same way as regular point counts. To be able to quantify prediction uncertainty, we developed models for 32 different bootstrap samples of the data within each sampling unit. Each of these samples was stratified by year and spatial cluster to improve balance. Avian data was matched with the corresponding vegetation data from one of two time periods, either 2001 or 2011. And we will, uh, in future iterations, we'll include annual inputs. For each of these data samples, we built boosted regression trees for the counts, specifying a Poisson distribution and incorporating the detectability offsets that I described earlier. Prediction diagnostics were calculated based on tenfold cross-validation. To predict density, we averaged across bootstrap replicates and smoothed across BCR subregion boundaries. We considered a total of 216 potential covariates in our models, automatically eliminating those that were most highly correlated in each subsample of the data. In all models, we included effects for year and survey type, either ARU or human point count, and then we considered 21 climate variables, 92 stand level vegetation covariates, which consisted of things like tree species biomass and age, and the same 92 covariates averaged across the surrounding landscape using what's referred to as a Gaussian filter, which is essentially a moving window weighted by proximity based on a normal distribution. We also included three simple land cover variables, 
five terrain variables at 100 meter resolution, and a coarse scale road layer at one kilometer resolution. Each individual model contained a subset of approximately half of these covariates, many of which had little or no predictive power. Variable importance scores are available online or as a download, uh, as a download file. The primary outputs that we've produced and shared are one kilometer pixel level density predictions expressed as males or pairs per hectare for a snapshot in time, in, uh, in our case 2011. These are accompanied by static maps, which you will see in a bit. We're also generating 250 meter predictions for each BCR subregion, which are not yet uh, posted on the website, but they can be requested from us. In addition, we have habitat-specific density estimates produced by what we refer to as post-hoc binning, which involves overlaying land cover classes of interest with the raster predictions to calculate mean densities for each class. Because most sources of environmental variation are captured in the models, these mean densities reflect the full range of conditions across the landscape rather than those of a biased sample. We've done this for a 2005 MODIS-based North American land cover layer, but a user could also do this with any other categorical land cover layer. And finally, we have produced population estimates that were calculated by summing up individual uh, pixel level densities within each spatial, spatial unit. We're still uh, working on annual predictions from which trends can be estimated, um, and we're doing this in collaboration with Adam Smith and Dave Isles at CWS. You'll, he you'll hear more about Dave's work later in this presentation. And with that, I'll turn it uh, over to Peter. Thank you, Diana. Hi, everyone. I'm Peter Solomos with the Boreal Avian Modeling Project. And after the introduction, I'm going to show you how to view and navigate these results that Diana has just introduced. Our first example species is going to be Canada border. In this map, you can see the results from 16 regional models put together and the map for the study area you can see this pale yellow region, which is outside of the species range. And within that, different shades of green representing different levels of population density. What's interesting to note here is although the predictions are stitched together from these regional models, these thresholds are based on the whole study area. So those represents how density varies across the whole region and you can see here this sharp change along the Manitoba Ontario border the western population represented with considerable smaller average densities compared to the eastern parts of the population within Canada we can overlay the species range on top of this density map and also the dots here represent the known detections for Canada Wobbler. This gives us an idea how the known range compares to our predictions and here we would expect the species range to extend more westwards. Because these results uh, are based on one square kilometer pixel level predictions. We can summarize these pixel level predictions across regions or within regions. For example, if we overlay some kind of land cover classification, we can calculate mean density within those land cover classes. So here, for example, for the whole study area Canada, we can see that density reaches highest levels in mixed wood and deciduous forests. This takes into account the whole study area, eastern and western parts for Canada Warbler. What's interesting here, you can see intermediate levels of density in wetlands and cropland and conifer forests. We wouldn't expect Canada Warblers in croplands, so this is a result of this post hoc binning procedure and possibly how our environmental covariates represent a wider area so for example if there is some deciduous forest adjacent to a cropland then our gaussian filter at the landscape level might pick it up the same way as we can calculate mean density over the whole study area we can look at smaller regions within that so for example bird conservation region six we can see how density varies across land cover types 
deciduous forest having highest densities. As compared to this, if we look at the eastern part of the species range and within bird conservation region 12, we can see that there's slightly higher density in mixed with forests, and this just highlights how this approach is really useful in highlighting these uh, regional differences between habitat selection. We can also look at smaller subregions, for example, for BCR6, how the southern part where population density is much higher compares to the northern part where you can see across the land cover types very uniform and low density levels deciduous is somewhat higher in the southern portion of bcr6 you can see mixed wood and deciduous forest topping this chart the same way as we could summarize the densities across land cover types we can look at how those numbers add up within these uh, BCR subunits. If we add those up for the whole study area, all the pixels, then we get for Canada Warbler 4.81 million males over the whole study area with lower and upper bounds in parentheses. We can do the same exercise for different bird conservation regions or subregions where we have these estimates. And if we divide the regional numbers with the area of that region, then we get average uh, population density for that unit. Now let's have a look at the website. To view the website, you need to go to borealbirds.github.io. Once you land on this page, you can browse the results by species or read our methods. In the top navigation, the most important par part is this search bar. If you start typing the name of your favorite species, then click on it. Now we are looking at the Ovenbird website page. You can also, by knowing the AOU code of the species, just go to species slash code, in this case slash oven, to view uh, well known species. We can see here the same national distribution and density map as we've seen before for Canada Warbler. For Oven Bird, we can see the gradient of varying levels of density. And to overlay the range map and the detections, in this right corner, we have this show detections tab. If you click on it, it hides and toggles these detections and the range map. You can see there is much better correspondence between uh, the range map and the detections and our estimates than for the previous species. If you scroll down, then these are the land cover based mean density values for Canada or for any other specific bird conservation region unit or subunit within that. If you scroll even further down, then you see the population size table for Canada, 38.8 million males for Ovenbird with lower and upper bounds based on the bootstrap distribution. Underneath this table, you will find some links where you can grab, for example, the raster layers shown in the map in GOT format. This link should take you to uh, the Google Drive where you can find those species specific distribution maps. If you want to download the summarized results, population size estimates and densities and other useful information, for example, variable importances and validation metrics and the list of uh, predictors, you can download this Excel file. The various sheets are going to uh, help you uh, browse the results by species. So this file actually contains the results for all the species. The TIFFs are for individual species. If you want to access these results programmatically, then I really recommend you checking out this JSON API, which is described in detail in this technical report. If you click on this DOI link, it should take you to the Zenodo website where we have a PDF outlining the methods. And if you read through, there are applications with some worked examples using R 
how to manipulate these results. Now going back to the Oven Bird page, at the very bottom of the page you can see a discussion area where you can leave some comments, have a discussion about these results. If I go back to the top in this navigation, click on methods, this is the brief outline of how we created these results, the description of the subregions and our methodology. The last link you can see in the top is contact which takes you to the BAM website where you can learn more about contributors and the data set itself and also under communications you can find those papers that you have mentioned as part of the talk. Now back to the slides. So we've talked about these pixel-based estimates. These are called pixel-based because we make predictions for one square kilometer units of the land base. Then we add these up in larger units to get population sizes. We did a similar study in Northern Alberta, which was published recently on the pages of the Condor, where we looked at how pixel-based estimates within BCR6 of Alberta compared to population size estimates for partner, from partners in flight and their approach uses roadside BBS data. So we expected to find differences between the two approaches. Once we took the ratio of the population size estimates for more than 90 species, those are the dots in this graph, then we found that the pixel-based uh, estimates were much higher than the partners in flight estimates. And this was to some extent expected because we know that these were driven largely by the differences between the maximum detection distance used by uh, partners in flight and our effective detection radius for the species which are consistently lower than the maximum detection distance which makes this difference between the population sizes. There were, however, species where the PIF estimates were higher than the pixel-based one, and we can see huge variation across the species, which is mostly attributed to other sources of uh, biases, which in this case is due to species reacting differently, like liking or disliking the presence of roads and their behavior and detection distances might change along the roads, and also road sample different habitats and if we have a south heavy sample of BBS routes then in the north we have habitats which might get less represented in our roadside sample which contributes uh, to this difference. Now we've looked at this across species in a single region. Given our current results where we have 16 such regions and we can even make smaller ones and 140 species across all of these, we can look at how these PIF estimates versus the pixel-based ones compare to each other. You can see here similar violin plots. The Canadian average is roughly two times the PIF estimate is what we get for the pixel-based one, although there is huge variation across regions. For example, bird conservation region 11 shows somewhat higher values for certain species which might be grassland specialists. Other regions you see lower numbers and even there are species where the PIF estimates are higher than the pixel based ones. So now we are looking at this and we also are in the process of updating our estimates for effective uh, detection uh, distances which is also then in turn going to be used for updating the PIF estimates. So if you happen to have distance sampling data that we could use, we are part of a collaboration with Adam Smith and his colleagues who are working diligently to update these numbers using fresh new data from not just Canada but from various parts of the US. So please get in touch. This leads us to some limitations and trade-offs that we wanted to mention regarding our national models. First off, these density offsets that we've used were developed for pastorines in mind and as a result population numbers may be overestimated for other species due to their dif different territorial behavior, their aggregation pattern for example along water edges or overlapping home ranges which might lead to double counting. 
we can address these concerns using independent estimates that we can use to calibrate our approaches to get better population sizes for these non-passerine species. Another issue might arise as a result of our regional modeling approach that we took to address certain spatial data gaps. This approach can lead to hard boundaries between BCR subunits and also in some cases it is difficult to capture range limits. Let's go back to the Canada mm -hmm. Warbler example. In this map we can see the results uh, from the 16 regional models put together and there is this hard edge that we've identified along the Manitoba-Ontario border. If we, however, put together a data set that involves all the data from Canada and we don't take this regional approach, just fit a single booster regression tree model, then now this hard boundary disappears. But what we get instead is overprediction outside of the species range here in the Western Mountains, Northwest Territories and Newfoundland. So there's this trade-off between having hard edges versus overprediction, and the national model results are heavily dominated by some regions where we have a lot more data from. So strong regional influences are mediated by going this uh, regional approach way. What you can also see in our maps here for black-throated green warbler, besides these edges alongside the Manitoba Ontario border that density is a lot lower in the western part of the species range as compared to the eastern part of the range. Now if you look at the map in the left which is a distribution map based on the detections only so there is no count or abundance information involved in this Maxon map that Diana described before which is very similar to just showing the detections from, for example, eBird, you can see what's inside the species range and what's outside where the species occurs versus not. Whereas our models, um, as opposed to that, indicate the different levels of density inside the range. So in the West, we are still inside the species range for black-throated green, but densities are much lower than in the East. The next example for the Tennessee warbler highlights how distribution versus abundance compares in the northern parts of the species range where our regional uh, density model approach is having a hard time of finding that northern range edge which is clearly visible in the Maxon maps in the left. Maybe this is a result of the species range extending into the subarctic regions or maybe we just have very few samples to support that. Our density predictions are meant to be used in various conservation applications. For example, these can be used to generate various indices of land bird diversity and intactness across Canada. One application of this work is led by WCS Canada to identify key biodiversity areas according to what's called criterion C, ecological integrity. We are combining our bird maps with human footprint maps to generate an index of biotic intactness. This work in progress should eventually help inform the identification of key biodiversity areas in Canada. The layers can also be included in a variety of systematic conservation planning exercises at scales ranging from regional to national. It will be particularly valuable to compare areas of land bird diversity with areas of importance for priority species like caribou. A new project initiated by ECCC will look at these synergies and gaps explicitly, work led by Becky Stewart and Ellen Campfield. Similarly, we are working with the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture to compare waterfall and land bird priorities for the Western Boreal region in order to understand how areas of importance for waterfall coincide or not with priority areas for land birds. These analyses are led by Barry Robinson based on models produced by Nicole Barker et al. Our models were not intended to be predicted in the future, but habitat-specific density estimates from our predictions can be applied to land use change simulations to anticipate future habitat value for birds. 
We are collaborating with the Western Boreal Project Initiative, a partnership between ECCC, NRCAN, and SPATE's team and academic researchers to apply our models to future change scenarios. This project is led by Samuel Ashe, Elliot McIntyre, and Tati Mishlati. We also modeled the impacts of forest management and natural disturbances using boosted regression trees for Canada warbler. And we use these population size estimates uh, to apply on simulated future conditions and quantify the likelihood of regional population persistence under different scenarios with an applied site selection uh, algorithm that maximizes uh, positive future trends for the species in each of the regions. This is work led by Francisco Dennis and is going to continue to inform species at risk critical habitat identification. As Diana mentioned in the beginning of the talk, we are working towards integrating our population estimates into official population trend estimates produced by the Canadian Wildlife Service. This slide shows some exploratory work by Dave Isles at CWS, CWS to combine migration monitoring data with stable isotope maps to develop regional trend estimates. Our density models can be used to weight regional trends in a national analysis. This example shown here is for black pole warbler. As we are working on our models, we are anticipating next versions based on a new uh, set of the data, which is going to include more years of BBS, additional regional data, and automated recording unit-based um, detections. We are also going to incorporate annual climate and land cover covariates to better match predictors and survey years. And also, we want to capture trends in landscape change. We are also planning to extend our modeling into neighboring US regions to incorporate data from the US that you already have. And also, we want to extend to the full boreal hemiboreal so that we can cover the breeding ranges of these boreal species. Future versions of the models would also possibly look at smaller subregions, but data gaps might still dictate what size of regions we can handle in this regard. And we're also thinking about using unclassified spectral data inputs, which will also uh, minimize the classification error that we can um, have in our data input layers. The key take home messages are that we use these pixel based population estimates, which we think is an improvement over sample based methods when the sample is biased with respect to habitat, as we can see with roadside samples. The BAM density models generate predictions from disparate data sets that can be rolled up into population estimates because we are using detectability offsets to standardize point counts across different methodologies. We employed machine learning algorithms to predict in unsampled areas. And many current applications are underway and probably more coming in the future. We wanted to thank uh, the BAM members, partners and funders, including Environment and Climate Change Canada, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. See the full list of funders and contributors on our website. You can see the BAM team here, the core members and contributing scientists and grad students. Thank you all for listening to this talk. Hi, my name is Deanna Strelberg and I'm with I try to unmute myself. Um, there was very a lot of information, so maybe we would benefit from listening to it again. <laughs> um, so I'd like to thank you guys both for for those presentations. That, that was really great. It's great to hear about the progress you've made. It's um, very impressive. And I think I'll, what I'll do now is just open it up for um, questions and discussion. There's a lot of people on the line, so um, 
I'll just start by opening it up, but if it gets to be challenging, we can use the uh, hand raising function. If there is, is there a hand raising function on Zoom? Yes, okay. Zoom is blocked for us, so we don't use it very often at CWX. But. So I will open the floor. If anyone had any questions or comments? While people are thinking about their questions, I do have one comment just to add because I feel like we maybe didn't uh, emphasize adequately in the presentation that really with the with respect to US uh, regions, we have in the past, we had data for Alaska in particular and a lot of the hemiboreal and just this is a bit of a temporary thing that we're not incorporating that data just because we really wanted to take advantage of some Canadian uh, vegetation layers. And so uh, we're moving back to that soon. And Peter did mention that, but I just thought I would kind of clarify in case people were wondering what happened to the US and those maps that's coming back. Yes, we do have those results, which are still preliminary, but we didn't include into this website update that still are sitting on our computer and waiting for us to go back and look at them and adjust some of the things we found. Uh, this is Wayne Thugman. I have a question, if, if I may. Um, yeah. My question is, um, you know, you, you uh, described at length the difficulty of fitting some of these regional based models together and the, and the boundary issues that you have. Would it be reasonable or possible to perhaps overlap, uh, have overlapping regions so that um, you can kind of uh, smooth across those over areas of overlap and reduce the amount of boundary concerns? We did do that. It may not have come across, I think the maps didn't show that area of overlap that well. Um, we do plan to incorporate more of that in the future. We had initially planned to do more of a STEM approach like eBird um, has been doing, but we just, uh, there are kind of pros and cons to having these um, kind of arbitrary rectangles versus these more um, uh, intuitive eco-region or bioregion uh, BCR units. And so we went with that and, and Peter actually developed a pretty sophisticated feathering kind of approach for the overlap, but you still just, you know, you still get that with in the absence of having smaller units. I don't know if you want to say more about that, Peter. But yeah, so we have that uh, 200 kilometer overlap that goes like in both ways, uh, 100 plus 100 kilometers at the edges. And when the edge happens to be like a BCR outline, which is wiggly, then it's not as striking as when you have like a straight province boundary. And even in that case, you have this 200 kilometer gradient, which still sh still shows up because it's quite uh, like a straight line, still a straight gradient along that line. And so we, st we, we tried to address it as much as we could. And yes, the proper smoothing would be just to have lots and lots of smaller regional units. And then we would then have to combine those together, which is, We've been thinking about this a lot, how to make this work and automate. And then every time we ended up just, okay, it might work in the South, but we have no idea how to really uh, do this in the North where the data is patchy. And so we would need like really large boxes, which would almost be kind of the same size as these regions that we've used. And uh, an argument for these regional models is that uh, people might use it regionally where these boundaries wouldn't matter much. And also it's easier to swap these if we have, for example, better available local information that we could use and update just one region at a time instead of figuring out which rectangles belong there and how to kind of then the, the randomization is, is not as straightforward in, in that sense. So I don't know. This is something we're still debating and trying to do our best to to get the best of both words. I saw there was a question from Becky that I could probably address if there aren't others about applications. Um, 
Can you speak a bit more to how your work has been integrated into conservation and applied to affect change on the landscape and or opportunities that haven't been taken to apply this work haven't yet been taken? Yeah, so um, as we, we, we uh, Peter talked about a few examples of efforts that are ongoing now because these models are pretty new in terms of being shared and finalized. We don't really have, you know, examples of how they have been you know, that have led to changes or conservation uh, action. But um, it's, we're doing similar things as we have used our earlier models to do in the past, which is things like conservation prioritization. Um, and we mentioned there's this project uh, looking at uh, key biodiversity areas. So we can kind of stack up our models and have a finer sense. I mean, the thing is we've used previous uh, distribution density models for this purpose, but they were never really reflecting um, also kind of local habitat characteristics that we now feel that these models do. So they can kind of be used in a lot of the same uh, ways that our earlier models had been used, but with more kind of, uh, they, re they reflect now something closer to actual density as opposed to just potential density or distribution. Um, so there's a lot of efforts that we've started working on and Peter um, mentioned a few of them. There's also working with uh, some of the forest certification programs to look at uh, bird densities within and outside of uh, certified forest lands. Um, and of course, just looking at, at gaps in conservation and how uh, bird priorities may or may not overlap with, or land bird priorities may or may not overlap with waterfowl priorities or other species. So. Um, I think there's lots of opportunities there and, and you, you all probably have other ideas as well. There's another question in the chat. Does BEM offer any training workshops on their methods for grad students? Um, should I? No. <laughs> well, no at, the, at this time time but uh, there are resources that we can point to because a year ago we had a uh, well it wasn't really BEM methods but this uh, detectability offset and uh, how to deal with uh, these types of count data there was a workshop at the AOU conference and those resources are available which covers some of some of uh, the methods that we've used, but not necessarily the boosted regression tree fitting and this large scale regional modeling aspect. So that is something we are thinking about and probably it will turn into some kind of course here at the University of Alberta, how to analyze bird data. And so once that happens, then probably it's going to be some kind of online version, which will be then made available to a wider audience, I'm sure. Peter, Marcel had a, a question that I think uh, maybe you should answer. Assumptions and methods behind habitat associations, for example, common bird density in cropland and grassland look surprisingly high. Yes, so we should uh, not forget that the North American land cover that we've used to intersect with these layers that, it, that was just one of the hundred and how much? 20 some layers of the inputs. So other information might have more influence on, on how the landscape was characterized and what went into the models. But this is a, a problem that shows up in many independent ways. So we're trying to address this in next iterations because this is not just happening with these types of uh, inventories, but we've seen similar issues in, in some of the Alberta models, especially in, in the southern regions where using different inventories, we see similar issues in agricultural lands. And we think that this is because of the scaling issues. So if we have a forest patch that is being sampled but characterized as cropland because of either spatial misclassification, like just somehow we happen to have the pin 
in the polygon or a raster, which is like just nearby. So there could be these spatial errors, but also if you think about those um, landscape level metrics that Diana created using this Gaussian filter, which extends well beyond the point, if there are substantial areas of developed land, then it's going to influence those, those values. So it'll show up as agriculture. However, maybe it was just at the very edge of it. At least that's how I interpret. And the second part of the question, well, hopefully this addressed uh, this point, at least as, as well as we could right now. And related confidence intervals for population estimates tend to be remarkably narrow compared to what we are used to seeing from other sources. How confident are you in the accuracy of these? Accuracy of the precision of the estimates. So these are confidence intervals, which when we make predictions reflect uh, the expected value. So not the possible range of outcomes, which I would say somewhere between zero and 10, anywhere it can be. So if, if we use a real prediction intervals for these, then those are going to be much wider, but also not very helpful because those are not going to uh, reflect that much variation. So another part of this is that this is just based on 32 replicates. And so what we see from those 32 repl replicates might be narrower than, than having like a lot more um, like just resampling, which would put together some of those like um, more like rare combinations, which would extend these confidence intervals. So I think that is also part of it. We had these time constraint that we wanted to get something out and have uncertainty, even though it's not like hundred or multiple hundreds of runs. And also we created, um, like map where you see how this varies spatially. So this is also just uh, uncertainty around these estimates, which are really aggregated up. So I think uh, what is worth looking at is how these relate to those pixel level uncertainties, like standard deviation or interquartile range based on the 32 maps, if you imagine. That's where this uncertainty is coming from. So I think, uh, the intervals around these aggregated measures is somewhat of a different question than uh, like the point level prediction uh, based uncertainty. So that's an interesting one. I'll look into it. Thank you. I was wondering if I could follow up on that. Um, and I was wondering if, if you think, are there like certain aspects of uncertainty that aren't being captured in I guess in the, the current sort of confidence intervals, things like uncertainty in the offsets and the offset calculations. And you know, I guess I wonder like how large typically are those, the uncertainty in those sort of offsets and, and are those, if, you were, if they get incorporated in there, would they tend to really magnify the confidence intervals on the national estimates? In my experience, not. So we tried to do this um, error propagation approach. So we created uh, estimates based on uh, model weighted approaches. So we, we have multiple models for these offsets and based on the AIC based support, you could create multiple um, predictions based on those. And then if for example, for each bootstrap prime, you have a different offset, then you could propagate those errors through uh, and add it to the prediction, but based on what we did in the past, it is relatively small compared to the other sources of uncertainty. And another reason why we didn't do it is it really, really complicates uh, how we can then measure any kind of uh, like valid validation metrics, because then we need to keep track of all those sets of, so not just the bootstrap sample, which points are entering the sample, but also what offsets we happen to use for those. So it is 
one side is that it seemed to be negligible and the other side is more of a technical issue that it made these follow-up steps a lot more difficult. I think we have time for one or two more questions if there are any out there still. I'm just reading the comments from Wayne. Yes, I was just going to read that. I thought that was a good way to end. Um, if there's no other questions at the moment. And we may have time um, after Barry's presentation to, to revisit this. And I think Barry's um, work will is a nice synergy to, to what we've just, uh, or builds on nicely to what we've just heard too. So we, we can certainly revisit. Um, but I will end this segment with Wayne's uh, recommendation here. He says, much as I think the US should outsource its foreign policy to the Swiss, I think the US should outsource its species distribution modeling and population estimation to the Canadians. So I think you can take that as a high compliment. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you very much. And now we will move on to Barry Robinson, who is a land bird biologist specializing in grassland birds uh, with the Canadian Wildlife Service. One of, one of the few um, grassland bird biologists at Environment and Climate Change Canada. So happy to have you and have you join us today. Um, and he's going to talk to us about using species density models to set habitat conservation objectives for declining grassland song, songbirds in the Canadian prairie pothole. And so, Barry, can you share your screen? Yep. Um, yeah, thanks, Alain, and thanks uh, for the invite to present here today. Can you guys see my screen now? Yes. You can hear me loud and clear? You're a little bit faint, but I, I'm not actually sure my volume's all the way up, so. Okay. I'm well, having problems, speak up. I'll try and get closer to the microphone here. Okay. Um, yeah, so thanks for the invite to, to present today. I, I'm really looking forward to getting, uh, just sort of spreading the knowledge that we're doing this type of work uh, to the broader community and to also get feedback from, from people in the fifth science group. Um, so as Elaine mentioned, I'm going to be presenting um, some work that I've done uh, using species density models, just like the ones that, that uh, BAM um, has produced and that Peter and, and Diana presented so well, um, to set habitat conservation objectives for grassland birds in the Canadian prairie potholes. So I'm not going to spend too much time uh, on background information. I think it's pretty common knowledge now that grassland birds in North America are in trouble. Um, you know, these, these two figures, the one on the left is from the, the most recent state of the birds in Canada report. Uh, and the one on the right is from the Rosenberg et al. 2018 science paper that, that quantified the, the actual number of birds that we've lost since 1970. And as you can see uh, from both of these sets of analyses, grassland birds are among the, the steepest and, and experiencing the most severe decline out of any other bird group. So I think this is pretty common knowledge now. And also that 75% of grassland bird species in North America are in decline, which is really concerning. Um, if you look at uh, Canada, where you know I work as part of the Canadian Wildlife Service, the vast majority of those grassland species occur within uh, bird conservation region 11, the prairie potholes. So this map here, um, uh, the insert up here just shows you where BCR 11 is in the context of the whole continent and then the, the blow up map is showing the Canadian portion of that so this is the Canada US border here uh, and this figure is showing the habitat types that are present um, uh, I think this is from 2018 I haven't had a chance to update this figure yet but as you can see the different colors represent the different habitat types and and the vast majority of BCR 11 in Canada is made up of cultivated or agricultural land and then the remaining native grasslands are shown in brown there um, are the second most abundant habitat type. Now I think it's probably fairly safe to assume that prior to European colonization, the back, like almost all of that beige cultivated area would have been grassland. So we're talking about a major um, loss, but I think it's 75% is the figure that we quote mostly. Uh, we've lost 75% of the grasslands in this area. And, and it's probably fairly safe to assume also that uh, that's one of the main reasons why we've seen such a, a dramatic decline in grassland birds. And the same is true in, you know, further to the south of the U.S., the vast majority of the grassland habitats have been lost there as well. So, so habitat loss is really what's driving this. Um, now, because of this, and, and, you know, we're still, I, we're, and we're actually still losing grasslands as well. Every year we're losing uh, remaining grassland habitat to cropland. So I think it's really crucial that we come up with a conservation strategy that's efficient and that uh, in a way that we can efficiently use conservation dollars to maximize the benefit to grassland birds. And we need to do it now. Um, and so 
because of that, I've, I've uh, the work that I've been doing for the last few years now, I've set two major objectives to try and um, give us tools that can allow us to spend conservation dollars efficiently. And the first objective I, I had was to identify priority areas for conservation. So um, find out the, the most important habitats that we can conserve in order to maximize the benefit to the, the most number of individual birds. Uh, and then also estimate the amount of habitat we need to conserve in order to, to meet population objectives we set for these species. So essentially I want to figure out where we should be conserving habitats and how much of it we need to conserve in order to uh, achieve population objectives that we have. And uh, I, I answered both of those questions using species density models and, and um, models very similar, you know, using the exact same technique that um, BAM use. So, so luckily I followed this presentation from Deanna and Peter, so I don't really have to go into the methods here. I, I really did follow their method very, very closely. Um, and as they nicely presented, essentially what this method allows you to do is combine these disparate data sets um, to estimate density by taking into account detectability um, for removal and distance sampling and also accounting for survey specific covariates. And so again, I'm not going to go into the details here because I, I really did just replicate their method. And there's a couple of papers there that was also mentioned in the previous presentation that you can look to if you want uh, more details. So using that method, I, I, uh, I again, I followed BAM's, BAM's lead in, in trying to amass a, a, as many point counts as I could. And so um, for BCR, the Canadian portion of BCR 11, I was able to get my hands on 74,000 point counts from 27,000 unique uh, locations. And, and very similar sources are the same sources that, that BAM used, you know, right? um, provincial, um, Breeding bird atlas data, breeding bird survey data, you can see the straight lines here are all breeding bird surveys, but also data from grad students, provincial governments, uh, federal government, and, and data I collected myself as well. So these are the point count data I used to create my density models. And uh, I also use boosted regression trees, you know, again, the same methods that BAM, BAM used, which allows you to use a, a wide variety of spatial covariates. Um, so these are the ones that I use, they're a summary of them. So habitat type, um, I use the annual crop inventory, which is produced by a a Agri-Foods Canada. And that's an annual inventory. So ever since 2009, they've released a 30 meter pixel resolution um, map that shows different uh, habitat types. And that's an annual thing. So um, unlike BAM, I was actually able to link the habitat type with the survey year. So this, the survey, that, the year in which the survey took place, um, the habitat data I'm using is linked to that same year. And the, the four habitat types that I was mainly looking at were the amount of grassland, cropland, shrubland, and forest surrounding point count locations. I also used a 30 meter resolution digital elevation model to look at elevation as well as terrain ruggedness, which is the standard deviation and elevation around the roving window. Um, to try and quantify differences, like, you know, as Diana and Peter mentioned, it's nice to have continuous variables when you can as opposed to discrete variables. So to try and uh, quantify variation in, in vegetation cover within those different habitat types. I used uh, early, mid, and late season MDVI. I used a 250 meter resolution uh, MODIS product for that. I also included um, the area of open water basins and the, the count of open water basins surrounding point count locations. And that's a product that was produced um, by Duck Limited in Canada. And then I used uh, six weather covariates. And this is just two examples, summer precipitation and number of growing degree days. And this again, um, for this, rather than using sort of long-term averages, I, I did, I was able to use weather data from each year and map them to the survey year using a product called Daymat, which interpolates weather data at one kilometer resolution across North America. Um, so those are the spatial covariates I use for my boosted regression tree models. And uh, in, in this process, I had enough data to create models for 48 different species. And this is just a breakdown of the different orders that those species are from. You can see the vast majority are, are passerines, and that's to be expected because point count surveys were pretty much designed for, for songbirds, not really designed. They don't work as well for the other bird groups. Um, but I, I was able to produce models for seven shorebirds and various other um, few species for various other orders as well. Um, but for this uh, analysis that, that about identifying priority areas, I was really wanting to focus on grassland birds. So, so um, when I was trying to use these models to identify priority habitats for grassland birds, I restricted uh, the analysis to 14 species of songbirds that primarily you know, are associated with grassland habitats or, or other open like shrubby type habitats. And these are the 14 species I used. Uh, this CV statistic here is just um, 
it's from the cross validation approach that you get uh, when you're doing these boosted regression tree models. You can think of it as essentially a, a, a correlation between observed and predicted data. You know, one would be a one to one correlation. So a perfect model would have a CV statistic of one. And there's, there's quite a bit of range there. You know, I think the highest, um, is a chestnut colored long term model has a CV statistic of 0.76. And Bobolink, I think, is my worst model for it. It's a, a CV statistic of 0.33. So it just gives you an idea of the variation in model performance I have for the species. So in order to use these density models to identify uh, priority habitats, I used the spatial conservation prioritization software called Zonation, which is based on the University of Health Safety. It was developed there. And I don't want to get into too much details about how this works, but essentially you, you input your, your density models. You can also use um, uh, probability of occurrence models or you know, relative abundance models, but I was using density models. And what gets output is a pixel based uh, relative priority map. And just in a nutshell, the way this works is cells, each cell of a raster layer is assigned uh, a priority rank. And that cell, uh, that rank is based on cell removal order. So what it does is it looks at each pixel and it looks at the proportional contribution so the density estimate for that pixel looks at the proportional contribution of that pixel to the whole population across your study site and it goes through multiple iterations in the first iteration it'll look it'll um, look at the proportional contribution across all species that you're dealing with um, and it removes the pixels that have the lowest contribution to the overall population size and if you do that through you know hundreds of iterations until all the pixels are removed and the pixels that are removed first have the lowest priority. The ones that are removed last have the highest priority. Um, zonation also allows you to use species weights as well. So if you, if you if certain species you deem more important than others, or you want them to be you know more weighted in your your um, choosing of priority areas, you can do that. And so what I did is I took advantage of the new 2020 version of the avian conservation assessment database, which I'm sure most of you are very aware of. This was developed by Partners in Flight. Um, and they actually have, in the new iteration, they have regional concern scores. So they actually have DCR specific concern scores. And I use those as my weights directly. Um, for those of you familiar with the database, I was actually using the RCSB, the regional concern score for breeding range uh, for those species. The only modification I used um, was that uh, if any species was listed federally under the Canadian Species at Risk Act, I just automatically bumped up their weight to the highest possible uh, concern score of 25 and that's just because you know from the Canadian Wildlife Service perspective these species should really receive um, you know more attention and these are the ones that are declining the fastest uh, the reason they are listed is because they have a more limited distribution um, and they're declining faster so I wanted to make sure they had the highest priority all those species probably they probably I think all had kind of high concern scores anyways but I just bumped them up and this is the output that you get from zonation. So uh, this is um, the, the the color variation is showing the variation in priority. It's actually the percentile. So the, the blue sort of purple color there is the 95th percentile. So those habitats are those areas are higher priority than 95% of the other habitats throughout the region. And if you look at sort of the 80th percentile and up, this is really essentially just outlining the remaining grassland areas in the region, right? So we know that those are obviously high priority. Um, but, you know, the modeling also tells us that there is variation within those grasslands and some of those grasslands seem to have a higher priority than others. I should also note, I should remember the, these gray areas here represent existing protected areas. So those ones are already protected. But um, from a, a, you know, an efficiency standpoint, if we want to conserve grassland birds, we really should be targeting these high priorities areas for conservation. And that will give us, you know, the maximum benefit and we need to conserve the, the maximum number of individual grassland birds. Uh, breeding in these areas. So that answers the where question, where should we be focusing our conservation dollars? And the next one is how much, so how much of, of how much habitat should we conserve in these high priority areas? Uh, and, the, and, and the first step to doing that is to actually establish population objectives. We can't, um, we can't know how much habitat to protect until we know how many, you know, the, the population objectives we have for these different species. And uh, for that, I looked to the Partners in Fight Land Bird Conservation Plan from 2016, which provided 10 year and 30 year objectives for all land bird species in North America. And these were essentially based on ACAD scores. This is from 2016, so they were using an older version of the ACAD scores. Um, but they provided these 10 and 30 year objectives. Um, 
and the way they work essentially is depending on which category a species falls in, uh, depending on um, its its concern score from the conservation database. Uh, they have so that's these different. So we, whether you have a red red watchlist species, an R yellow watchlist species, B yellow watchlist species, um, depending on which category the, each species falls into, they have different ten year and thirty year objectives. So for this part of the exercise, the how much uh, objective, I'm just sort of doing a case study example using um, sort of the four flagship grassland bird species that, that are declining the steepest. They're all listed under the Species at Risk Act in Canada. And that's the Baird Sparrow, uh, Chestnut Cone Longspur, the Thick Billed Longspur, which is just renamed to the Towns Longspur, and the Sprague's Pippet. And so all of these species fall in the D yellow watchlist category. So um, the, the short term goal in the first 10 years then is to slow the rate of decline, the current rate of decline that we have from the DBS trend estimate by 60 to 75 percent. And then over the long term, over 30 years, the goal is to have these populations increase by 5 to 15 percent relative to 2016 population estimates. So that's this yellow graph bar here in the graph that we're trying to reverse the decline and eventually increase those populations. So the only problem though is that these PIP population objectives are range-wide objectives, right? And I'm um, really looking at um, objectives specific for bird conservation region 11 in Canada. So I took advantage of a tool that was developed for bobolink originally um, that actually looks, uh, attempts to step down those range-wide objectives put forward by PIP to um, uh, BCR specific objectives. And I'm not going to go into details um, about um, about how this this works, but essentially, what what you do is you look at the PIP population estimates in the different regions and the BBS trends, and you can tweak your trend objectives for each uh, BCR, and then see what the resulting range-wide trend would be. So it allows you to sort of tweak your little your your BCR specific trend objectives. And I use a modified version of this tool to to set the trend objectives specific to um, the Canadian portion of bird conservation, Region 11. Sorry, my presentation is just, oh, there we go. Um, yeah, so these are the, the, um, the four trend objectives for these four species that range from, uh, these are the 10 year objective, I should say. So the goal for Sprague's Pippet is to, to, to decline the, or reduce the rate of decline to negative 0.6% per year. And that ranges up to negative 2.5% per year for chestnut colored monster. So now the next step is to translate those trends into habitat objectives, those trend objectives to habitat objectives. And I, I did this again using species density models. So as Gianna and Peter uh, demonstrated, you can use these species density models to estimate population size. And because density models are based on habitat, um, doing that provides a link between you know, the amount of habitat on the ground and the population size. So that's how I, I use density models. So I'm gonna walk you through the workflow here and how I, I tried to use that link that you get from the density models to set habitat objectives. So first I, I conducted spatially explicit simulations of grassland loss throughout the landscape. And then I, uh, over time at various loss rates, and then I extrapolated my density models to, to those simulated landscapes over time and, and estimated population size. And from that, I established a relationship, species specific relationship between grassland loss and population decline. I then um, looked at estimates of actual grassland loss rates from BCR 11 and, um, and the PIF population objective that I just showed you. And then from that, I could determine how much grass we need to protect or how, how much we had to slow the rate of grassland loss in order to meet those pit population objectives. So I'm just going to walk you through an example. Oh, sorry, one more thing. Um, to conduct those simulations, the spatially explicit simulations, I took advantage of a um, model that was created by Sarah Olin at the World Wildlife Fund and I. Uh, and published last year in Ecological Indicators um, that predicts the probability of a uh, grassland pixel being converted to cropland. So this is just, a, that's what this map is showing here. Um, areas in blue are showing the lowest probability of conversion. And areas in red are actually, these areas in red have already been converted, but as you switch from blue to red, those are, you you're increase your probability of, of conversion. Uh, and I don't want to get into details of how that was created, but you can look at the paper if you're interested. Um, but what I did to simulate grassland loss is I, I did a weighted 
random sample of grassland pixels. So any if uh, pixels that were a higher probability of being converted to cropland based on this model would have a higher likelihood of being drawn in my random sample. Um, so once I simulate grassland loss, in order to extrapolate my density models to those simulated landscapes, I also had to figure out how to, how to treat all the other variables in my species density models. So first, as I simulated grassland pixels changing to crop, I had to update the NDVI values because obviously the, the NDVI is going to be different for, for crop pixels than they are for grassland. And so what I did is I just looked at surrounding uh, existing cropland pixels. So if a pixel gets changed to cropland from grassland to cropland in my simulation, I looked at actual cropland pixels surrounding that and just took the average NDVI value. Uh, for weather, I held my weather variable constant at the 10 year average for all the different weather variables. And then all the other variables, topography and then wetlands and all the other habitat types, I just held constant. So I'm really just simulating grassland loss here, and seeing how it affects the population size. So now I'll walk you through an example with Sprague's pivot. Um, so what you're looking at here on the left is a map showing um, the darker brown represents grassland habitat, the, the lighter color represents all other habitat types, and then you can see the actual area in hectares here. This is at year zero, and on the right, this is um, the extrapolated population density map, so darker colors represent higher density. And then you just sum up those pixels, and this gives you the, the population estimate of uh, male strikes with it. So I think I'm gonna skip two years ahead at a time here just so you can see the difference, but as you go through, you can see the grassland pixels go down and the resulting population estimate also goes down. I'll just do that one more time so you can see how it works. So I did that um, at various grassland loss rates. I think this is showing a really extreme example of like an 8% loss rate just to demonstrate how it works. But if I do that um, at various loss rates, you can, you can produce a figure like this. So this is showing year on the x-axis and uh, population size and number of males in millions of males on the y. And then the different colors represent different simulated loss rates for grassland. And the, the shaded areas are error bars and that's uh, from the errors in the models themselves. Um, because I did bootstrap sampling in the, in the, for the BRT models and actually have error estimates for each pixel. So if you look back at the PIP population estimates, they're actually, or the, sorry, the trend objectives, they're actually based on um, percent change in 10 years. So they're based on the difference in the two endpoints of these simulations. So another way to look at this, the same data, is by putting the um, annual grass and loss rate on the Y, or sorry, the X axis, and then looking at the annual population uh, decline rate uh, over a 10 year period on the Y. And so now what we can do once we have this information from the simulations is we just look at the, the PIP population objective. The, the, this is the step down population objective for Sprague's pivot. And I can figure out what maximum, what's the maximum grassland loss rate that we can allow in order to meet that objective. So in order to meet the Sprague's pivot objective, we can't lose grasslands any faster than 0.34% per year. And you do that, I did that for the other four species for um, Baird Sparrow, the maximum allowable loss rate is 0.78% per year. For thick billed long spur, it's 1.97% per year. You can, you'll notice the error bars are quite a bit wider for this species, and that's because the, um, the model is not as, the density model doesn't perform as well as the other species. I have there's much less data for McCown's long, or thick billed long spur than the other species. Um, and then finally, the uh, maximum allowable gra uh, grassland loss rates for chestnut colored long spur is 2.67% per year. So once I have those maximum allowable loss rates, the next thing is to look at actual loss rates across the landscape. And this is much easier said than done. Um, this is a really, I don't want to call it a black box, but this is an area that requires a lot more work, um, especially in Canada, actually. And there's a couple of different sources for this, but I've for this example, anyways, you can use any any loss rate estimate that you have. But for the, the example I'm, I've used is um, from work done by Sean Fields and Kevin Barnes of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they attempted to quantify the loss of not just grasslands but all uh, undisturbed habitat, natural habitat, uh, within different joint ventures across the Great Plains. And um, this is showing um, loss rates on the left here, and from 1990 to. 
2010 in the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture, which is very similar to the Canadian push for BCR11. And on the right, this is showing more recent declines from uh, 2011 to 2017. And so there are estimates that the earlier decline rate was about minus 0.44% per year, and the more recent declines are much higher at minus 2.62% per year. Now, I have to meant like reiterate that this is all cover types not just grassland so this would also include wetlands shrubland and maybe forest uh, although i doubt there's much deforestation going on in, in um, bcr 11. Uh, so it's, it's not the perfect estimate but it's sort of a starting point um, because a lot of that habitat loss likely is grassland so now it's just a matter of simple math if we look at um, the uh, allowable loss rates that for each species, this is showing species here, um, based on my simulations, and then the actual loss rates, the, the amount of protection you need is essentially just the difference between those two. So this is the amount, the rate at which we have to protect grassland habitat in order to meet those objectives. And, and it seems like Sprague's pivot is the one that has, needs the highest protection rate. And so that would automatically become our, our goal. So in order to meet the Sprague's pivot PIF population objectives, my modeling predicts that we need to conserve 3,400 square kilometers or 1,300 square miles of grassland per year for the next 10 years. So that's a staggering amount of habitat. Um, just to put some context on that, that, here's my map that I was showing you before. Uh, that's what 3,400 3, 3, square kilometers looks like. So, you know, this is based on that, um, that uh, estimate of, of, of loss of all undisturbed habitat. So the grassland loss rate might be lower than that, I hope it is because you know, this is the amount of area we'd have to protect in order to meet those PIP population objectives. And that means we're losing more than this per year, like more area than that per year in grassland. Now keep in mind that it, you know, there's a lot of grassland pixels that are sort of out and isolated surrounding it out here that add up to, to larger areas. So it's a bit deceiving, but the take home message is that, you know, in order to meet these objectives, we really need to start conserving grassland. And, and really we can't afford to lose any grassland as part of the take home message. Um, so I think that for next steps, I, I, I think it's really important that we really get a handle on um, getting accurate estimates of grassland loss rates. And there's a lot of people working on this right now in both Canada and the US, you know, with, with some of the remote sensing technology we have these days, it should be a fairly, I don't want to say easy exercise, but we have the technology to do it. It's just a matter of, of getting it done. Um, so once we improve these estimates of grassland loss rates, we should have a better idea of, of how much we need to conserve. Um, the next step I also want to, uh, I sh what I showed you was how much habitat we need to conserve in order to meet short-term objectives set forward by PIF, but I also would like to look at the long-term objectives as well. And if you remember for these four grassland species, the long-term objective is to increase the population by five to 15% over 30 years. And so the only way we're gonna do that is by actually reclimating grassland, cropland pixels back to grassland. It's the only way we're gonna see any increase in these populations. And so what I'd like to do as well is try and do a different simulation where I actually simulate cropland pixels being converted back to grassland and how that affects the population, uh, how that, and, and see how many, how much land we actually need to reclimate in order to meet those long-term objectives. And of course, we just need to conserve grasslands. The, the, the take home message is, is if we have any hope of meeting these population objectives set forth by PIF, then, then we really need to, to stop the loss of grasslands now, basically. So. Um, with that, I'm happy to take any questions or have comments and feedback from the group. Thanks, Barry. That, that was great. And it's nice to see that you've been able to um, incorporate so many of the various um, PIF tools and, and products into your work. It's um, really encouraging to see that. Um, I think worked nicely to have people entering questions in the chat. So maybe we, should we start with that? I see there's one already um, from David Isles. Um, would it be worthwhile to validate this approach by applying your habitat density models to the observed habitat loss over the last 30 years and evaluate whether your hindcast population change estimates are consistent with observed population changes? Yeah, that's definitely, and that's definitely something that I've considered doing. And um, the problem is we don't really have a good handle on, on how much grassland we've actually lost. Um, especially because, you know, you look at those those trend objectives, or the, all the trends we have are relative to 1970, and, and we just don't know, we, we weren't, we didn't have the remote sensing technology to track grassland loss that far. So the furthest back we can really go is like the 1990s. 
Um, but yes, I think that would be a valuable exercise to see if, if uh, the relationships I'm getting between loss and decline uh, match that of what we've actually seen in, in reality. And that would be an, another good, uh, valuable reason to do that is because, um, you know, I think it's not, it, I don't think it's just grassland loss in Canada that's causing decline. There's also grassland loss in the winter range in Mexico, which, which evidence suggests could be an even bigger issue. Um, so if there is a disconnect between uh, what my models are predicting and what reality is, I think that could be driven by pressures off the breeding grounds that could be causing further declines. All of this assumes that, you know, remember all this, all this work assumes that um, uh, there's still about a viable wintering range in the south in Mexico and southern U.S. So that's a big component too. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, hi. Um, so thanks for that, Barry. I want to reiterate what Alain said. I mean, it's fantastic to see some of this stuff uh, actually used. <laughs> we come up with these, you know, ideas. A lot of it is conceptual. This is uh, the most sophisticated, best example I've seen yet of, you know, an attempt to really play that out in terms of, of the population objective. So really appreciate that. Um, my question though, because another assumption you had right up front is that it was kind of a one-to-one -one relationship between habitat acres and decline. And that's what you know, the model is based on. And I'm wondering just whether, you know, if it's possible to incorporate some demographic factors. So for example, if you could increase productivity on 10% of your acres, you know, so that not every acre is equal. Is there a way to achieve the objective sooner or with fewer acres if you could, tr you know, at least model the effect of increasing productivity or affecting the demographics in some way within those acres in terms of habitat quality, if that's something you're able to do or thinking about doing? Yeah, definitely something we're thinking about doing. Unfortunately, we just don't have the demographic data to do that. Like that's that's what um, is being done for waterfowl. Like Ducks Unlimited Canada, in conjunction with the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture, is doing just that. They're looking at um, they're setting you know wetland conservation objectives based on demographic models that they have. So, you know, they know if you conserve these types of wetlands in these areas, you can produce this many ducks. Unfortunately, we just don't have that demographic data um, at such a fine scale for grassland songbirds. The work that Bird Conservancy of the Rockies is doing uh, with Baird Sparrow for the full life cycle model is, is definitely working toward that. And I think going forward, if we continue to collect those types of data sets, we certainly could could model that. But it, you know, you really need that demographic data to be able to model demographics relative to habitat types and, and weather too. Right? With grassland birds, weather plays a huge factor in uh, productivity, regardless of what habitat is. Um, so yeah, I would love to do that. And that's something we've talked about, but we just need more demographics modeling or monitoring in order to do it. Yeah, thanks. Great, uh, I'll, I'll read another one from the chat. Um, I was curious if you'd given any thought to where to protect grassland habitat under a changing climate. Are the areas that are, under priority, that are a priority now still going to be a priority under future conditions? Yeah, that's, so that's something um, that I've definitely been thinking about. And actually the, the, the specific weather variables that I chose for my models, I chose because we have IPCC climate projections for those variables. So I kind of planned out hoping that eventually I could incorporate climate change into this to see how those priority areas might change in the future. And I think that's a really critical step, right? Because if we're gonna put all of our effort into conserving grasslands in these certain areas based on these models, you know, we're banking on the fact that those are still going to be high priority habitats in the future. So, um, yeah, that sort of in my work plan is to try and incorporate climate change into this as well. And then another one from Scott uh, Summershewitt, maybe more of a comment, but I'll read it anyway. Um, we also need to consider energy development like oil and gas um, as maybe we don't lose a lot of acreage of grass per se, but the rose structures and noise are generally disliked by these species and there's productivity consequences. Oil and gas development can render a lot of re uh, remaining grass as poor at best for these species. Yeah, and I totally agree with that. And, and uh, you know, and that could be doable, you know, we, if, um, as long as we have the spatial variable, you know, that spatial data on oil and gas development, which is we do have in Canada, um, you could start incorporating those into your models. You know, the, 
you would run into the same uh, issues that the folks running up in the boreal with, with trying to deal with uh, logging and linking you know your, your actual survey data to you know the, the disturbance that was there at that present time so depending on what the temporal resolution is of those oil and gas variables but but certainly that's a, a, a something we have to consider and related to that is also the the native versus tame uh, problem we have with grassland so Right now, we have we're not very good at identifying uh, or distinguishing between native and tame grasslands. Um, so that's another, and, and obviously native grasslands are much better for these species than tame are. Uh, so that's another um, variable that I'd like to include going forward. So probably irrelevant given the state of grassland loss, but I, I was thinking about the golden wing warbler um, talk that was given this morning where um, it was so important to locate prior to prioritize areas that were within proximity of, of populations. And I know that grassland birds probably operate very differently with respect to dispersal, but that, I mean, maybe that's another, I mean, if we really did want to highly prioritize areas that were more likely to be colonated versus those that weren't, and that relates to the climate change question as well, maybe that's something else to build into those those prioritization models that you described earlier on in the talk. Although I, I, I guess conventional wisdom is that grassland birds are wide ranging dispersers looking for, looking, finding, being able to find viable grass, you know, way beyond the ability of other, some other species types to do that kind of thing. I don't know, just thinking about that. Yeah, no, and that's, that's certainly true because, you know, you, you we have evidence that suggests some, you know, one year a bird will breed in southern Alberta and the next year it'll breed in North Dakota, right? So it's, and I think that there's evidence too that they're following uh, ideal weather conditions as well. So I think grass and birds are probably have a bigger dispersing ability, but certainly, you know, looking at things like fragmentation and, and isolated grassland pixels versus large chunks of grassland, which does have uh, an effect on demography, I think that would be an interesting thing to do as well. Yeah, that's true. Going back to Ken, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> One thing related to that and climate change is it would be interesting to expand your study area to include some of the parkland and boreal regions that, you know, are projected to become a lot more suitable for a lot of these species. And so, you know, the, the rate at which that could actually happen is, it differs across that region, but uh, you could make some interesting assumptions. and that would actually kind of change some of your um, ability to meet objectives as well. Um, not that you'd want to rely on that, but it'd be an interesting thing to explain. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, the difficulty there is that, you know, you have, as the climate shifts, then as you, you know, the, the, the climate envelope for grasslands is probably gonna get pushed further north. But, you know, if all those habitats are already in cropland, you have to have the climate change and then they have to be put back to permanent cover in grasslands as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah. that, it's really hard to model, as I'm sure you know with oh, sure. climate change work you've done too. I'm just curious, Barry, I, know, I feel like I remember at one point you were discussing the idea of building in a cost layer also to your um, prioritization model. I was wondering if you had had any success in doing that and if, how that changes the picture. Yeah, so that's that's an interesting point, and it's, it's something we have talked about at the PHGV Science Committee meetings, and it's certainly what they do for waterfowl. They definitely put a, a you know a cost per acre, and they look at they're trying to look at dollars per duck essentially, right? Like you're, you're trying to maximize the amount of money or minimize the amount of money you spend to maximize reproductive output, and uh, yeah, I mean it could be done, and, and as long as you have that economic data uh, spatially, it's, it's 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 available, but it's not something I've done. Um, yeah, so there, you know, there's a bunch of factors at play. There's the biological factor, like how how many birds there are in these landscapes, there's the cost that it is to conserve it, but then also the risk of loss as well, right? So you got to kind of factor all those things in, like, you know, should you target areas that are at high risk of loss, but maybe not the best habitat for birds, or should you, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of different things at play, but uh, we, that's why we need the econo economists uh, on board for this, the so socioeconomic, socioeconomics is a big factor for sure. And what's driving grassland loss is all economics, right? That's something we have to remember. Um, yeah, like people, the reason they're converting grassland to cropland is because they can make more money doing that than they can running cattle on it, for example. So that's a huge factor that I haven't incorporated yet, but hopefully with 
collaborations from from socioeconomic professors and things like that we can go that route eventually yeah i think i think it'd be interesting because there's you know there's a variety of conservation tools that we have in canada that could work on different pieces of the of the puzzle so if you think about the commitment to protect 25 percent of our terrestrial area by 2025 a lot of you know it's sort of a cost per hectare is a big piece of that, whereas potentially work through the Priority Places Initiative might be more on areas that are have higher suitability for restoration or for um, you know, more um, uh, integrated habitat management or those. So you could think about there'd be different areas that you'd be highlighting depending on what the conservation tool is that you're going to be applying. Right, yeah. So just curious how you use the uh, the bobbling tool for projecting um, so for looking at population objectives across these across the different units. Did you did you apportion the the trend the the trend objective equally across each of the different um, units that are that are in that tool? Or you know you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. No. Yeah. Um, I, I have to look back on my notes. It's, it's quite the, that it's a very subjective process, right? Because yeah, you're just tweaking individual trend objectives for each region. And I think I even considered whether JVs had, um, you know, for example, the Prairie Pothole Joint Venture is very active in trying to set habitat objectives for grassland birds. And so I kind of assumed that they would, you know, contribute a lot to the, to the improvement of the trends. Whereas some of the other JVs where I, I don't have any evidence that they're actually working toward that, I said, okay, well, maybe I'll assume they're they're going to continue having a decline there. Um, I'd have to look at my spreadsheet, but I've got a lot of notes in there and how I make those decisions. Yeah. But it is quite subjective, that's the problem. Um, and just that now that I'm thinking about that, the next thing I wanted to also do um, is, you know, since all these species are listed federally through the Species at Risk Act, they have recovery strategies. And so I think what I want to do next is, is do the same approach, but look at the recovery, the, the population objectives within the recovery strategies as well see if they're feasible and I, I've done that a little bit and it, you know it seems like they're equally hard to reach those, those objectives you know we really got to stop grass and loss in order to meet any of them there's another question in the chat I don't know if you've noticed it pop up there but um, do you have any sense of how much grassland loss is land converted to irrigation agriculture the cost of irrigation will change over time as water tables decline. Are these possible as locations for restoration? Yeah, I mean, certainly that irrigation is a huge role in this. And I think the reason we have grasslands left where we do is because they're really dry places that are hard to irrigate. Um, but another, so, you know, climate change is one thing, but another factor there is technology. You know, 50 years ago, we could, or, you know, we could, our irrigation technology has improved a lot. You know, the government of Saskatchewan now is just talking about this huge multi-billion dollar project that's trying to improve irrigation in, in certain areas in southern Saskatchewan. And that really has a risk of, of uh, driving up grassland loss. So definitely something that needs to be considered. Um, but I don't have a sense on, on how much that's driving things. And we have another comment from Christian. Um, for various reasons, such as those mentioned around climate change and nomadic and the nomadic culture of grassland birds, I think we need to use these tools more for the questions of amount to conserve plus res and restore in relation to objectives, rather than the question of where. And also, spatial configuration aspect of the where question is very worthwhile. Right. So you're saying it yeah, because because we know your climate is going to change. Uh, it, it's very likely that the, the wear part's going to change. So it's really just the how much that's important. And I think what you mean by spatial configuration is, you know, not just conserving all these little patches of grassland, but trying to get big chunks of it, which we know is better. So I totally agree. Yeah. I have a question, Barry. Can you sure. hear me? Yeah. Hi, it's, hi, it's Wendy Easton, Canadian Wildlife Service. Sorry. Hey, Wendy. I figured it's easier than me typing. <laughs> uh, I wondered if you, um, sort of following up what Christian has said, I always wondered with um, grassland birds, 
like if we should have some resilient ratio type thing, whereas you figured out, okay, Sprague's Pippet needs this volume of grassland we need to conserve. Should we start thinking about like the flexibility, not only of the species, but the type of ecosystem requirements that, that they need? And maybe we say, ah, based on climate change and how dramatic our weather is shifting and the narrow constraints of this species that we should take this amount and times it by two. You yeah. know, or, or those types of things that um, we can justify. So we do that in Canadian Wildlife Service when we're talking about like wetland compensation and how difficult it is to restore wetland. So we start thinking about those sort of broad multiplication factors and, and trying to fit that into our our plans when somebody's going to destroy something, you know. So I wondered if you've given any thought to that type of thing. Yeah, well, I, I, there's a study, recent study last year by I think it's by the Audubon uh, Society that uh, looked at resilience of grassland birds uh, relative to climate change, and they, they they I think they had some sort of a rank to show which ones are most vulnerable. And uh, and I think all the four species that I'm talking about were quite vulnerable to like their other look at the climate envelope and how vulnerable they would be to losing their habitat even if we just left the habitat where it is uh the shifting climate might make anything that's left unsuitable so yeah it's certainly something we have to consider and and, and it's something i haven't done directly but i hope with some of the climate change modeling to do that and um so maybe we need to yeah you might need to conserve even more than what's presently there if, if those, are, those predictions are true Got another question, um, I guess, to put a couple of people on the spot, maybe, who I see uh, named over there. I'm just curious, um, you know, given how much attention and how much work's going on in the U.S. side for some of these same species um, across that whole region, you know, how much coordination there is right now across the border and how much of, you know, your work, Barry, uh, how it compares with the work from for Conservancy of the Rockies folks and, and whether there's any talk about suturing efforts, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, actually, um, well, we have the Western Partners in Flight Western Working Group meeting coming up in November and, and that's, we have a grassland session that's actually just that, trying to stimulate synergy across border for grassland conservation. Um, and so there's definitely, the communication is definitely there. I'm in, talk, I'm in communication with Arvind and Scott Summers who was U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and actually, I just uh, obtained the IMBCR data set from Bird Conservancy of the Rockies in, in, in sort of the hope in the future that I can ex like expand the modeling process into the U.S. as well. You know, once I have, now that I have the process established, the R code developed, you know, it's, it's not that hard to um, expand the, the range. I mean, there's the issue of having sort of different sets of spatial covariates across the border, but really, um, I think the only one that's sort of from a different source would be habitat type. And I know that the U.S. has a very similar um, product to the our annual crop inventory. So I think it's very doable and the data is certainly there. Um, so yeah, like I, I, would, I would love to see a range wide initiative. You know, of course, working for the Canadian Wildlife Service, our mandate is for Canada, but, but you know, I, we have no illusion that there's a, a, an actual biological border at the 49th parallel. So, um, but yeah, the conversations are there and, and, and I think the right people are being linked together for, for making this a range-wide thing. Great, thanks. We should probably make that uh, part of the Grassland Roadmap Summit too, Barry, I think. To follow up on that. Yeah, for sure, yeah, I agree. Sorry, Evan. Oh, that's all right. Um, we just got one another question from Graham Patterson. Um, in relation to that question, I'm about to start as coordinator of a joint venture grassland bird program, which is intended to coordinate efforts over eight JVs that cover the grassland biome. Oh, cool. No question there, but congratulations on your new position, Graham. Yeah, I should get your your email, and uh, I, I know very much about the eight joint venture initiative, and um, you know a lot of the objectives set forth in that. Sort of agreement across those eight joint ventures uh, 
you know, the objectives are exactly what I just presented to you. So, so uh, yeah, I think it would be great to try and replicate this across yeah. the whole group. So really great thing. Can you hear me on this now? Yeah. Yeah, this is Graham. So yeah, I don't start till next week, um, but this is an effort that the eight joint ventures that cover the entire grassland biome, um, breeding uh, migration and wintering range are trying to get a handle on how to coordinate an approach that, that you know, covers the entire range of, of these key species, the ones you mentioned particularly. So uh, yeah, this is me getting my feet wet in this area. Uh, I'm no grassland bird expert, but I am a conservation planner and strategist, so I should be able to help them. That's great. Yeah, and, and you know, all this work has been done uh, in conjunction with the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture uh, the whole way through. Um, and a lot of this work is going to be in the next implementation plan, uh, which is coming out uh, next year. Um, and, and they're part of that HAV. So, so yeah, but I think we should definitely work together and, and make this happen. Yeah, I'll just put my email address up there, but it's not going to be my ultimate official email uh, until I start work, but I'll give you my Gmail address and we can start. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Great. I have, I have one last question. Who did all those point counts in Manitoba? Was that Christian? There was probably, a remarkable he, difference across the province. <laughs> I'm sure he did some of them. Um, that is from the uh, Manitoba Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, so that's why there's so many point counts. And, there's uh, also a bunch of SARPEL uh, point counts in there, Len, from the Species at Risk Partnership on Agricultural Lands. And so there's a, but yes, an emphasis on point counts in Manitoba. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, uh, Kyle Drake, who's leading the Saskatchewan Breeding Bird Atlas right now, every time he sees my map, he's just like, oh my, he has big shoes to follow. <laughs> Try and, but yeah, Saskatchewan Breeding Bird Atlas, so we're in year three, we just finished, or year four. Um, so I, I think I had two or three years of data in that map I showed you. So hopefully Saskatchewan gets for that density as well. Great. Any other questions for Barry or Deanna or Peter? Hey, this is uh, John Alexander. Sorry, I came in late. I was sitting on the phone for a while. Um, just wanted to give you guys a heads up. So um, we've been doing a little bit of similar work. It seems similar, at least looking at raw spectral Landsat imagery. We recently published a paper uh, describing effects of fragmentation um, on birds using Landsat occupation distribution models. Um, and we're developing some online tools for being able to um, look at different habitat types and species occurrence as, as indicators of habitat conditions in those types. We did that in the Klamath Mountains eco region. We expanded that and we're working on a paper looking at sage grouse habitats in the northern basin and range eco region. And now we're in the process of working with a huge region eight forest service point count data set from 20 years and we're going to develop similar models like that and i think kind of like what you guys were producing it will allow us to forecast and backcast um distributions that could then be compared with bbs trends and other kinds of things it's it's um presence absence at this point we haven't gone to the abundance level but seems very similar seems like comparing notes on some of these different kind of research projects is a a great opportunity and um, use of this science committee. So some similar stuff coming out soon to be um, in the Southeast, but very actively using these things in the Pacific Northwest. That's good to know. Just pausing for a moment in case there's anyone else who wanted to jump in. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. And I appreciate the, the big crowd that we have here. And I definitely appreciate our uh, speakers today. I think it was give us all a lot to think about a lot of great um, overlaps with the PIF science work and, and a lot of, as we already said, great to see some of the, the tools that PIF science has been working on for many years um, being applied out there on the landscape. Um, and so I just want to say thank you, great thank you to, to all of you. And then just to remind everybody, we have one more special presentation scheduled for next Wednesday, October 14th, um, from 1 to 2 Eastern. 
Um, so we will have an overview of the new BBS um, strategy for the next, I don't know how many years it covers, but uh, Veronica Ponte and Adam Smith from CWS are going to be uh, giving us that presentation. So don't forget. Go ahead, John. <clears throat> yeah, just one other announcement. People on the Partners in Flight Science listserv would probably have received an invitation uh, to save the date for December 1 through 3 for the the second part of the um, Species of Decline um, Road to Recovery workshops. So right now we're thinking, we're asking people to, to save those those dates December 1 through thir 3. I think that's a Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, if my memory serves me right. But um, So if you haven't seen that um, Save the Date flyer, um, well, I guess ask somebody to <laughs> send me an email and we'll send it to you. Yeah, and there's going to be an updated uh, version of that next week that'll have uh, a little bit more agenda and speakers, but we just want to make sure everybody's aware um, of that coming up. Great, thank you. With that, I will wish you all a good afternoon and 